Hello, this is Rachel Sheckman, Senior Analyst of Systems Transformation at the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Joining me in a conversation about improving access to care for people living with HIV, specifically through Medicaid and public health partnerships, are Randy Mayer, the Chief of the Bureau of HIV, STI, and Hepatitis at the Iowa Department of Health and Human Services, and Sarah Reseter, Chief of Compliance and a Deputy Director for Iowa's Department of Health and Human Services. Randy and Sarah, thank you for joining me today. Let's dive right in. Iowa has recently gone through a realignment of its various departments, combining multiple government programs and services that previously operated within two different agencies, the Iowa Department of Public Health and the Iowa Department of Human Services, into a single reporting structure with the various programs reporting directly to the Iowa Department of Health and Human Services. This new alignment has resulted in changes to how programs such as the state's Medicaid and the Bureau of HIV, STI, and Hepatitis communicate and coordinate. In general, can you describe how that process has gone? And what was the original intent of the realignment? For the last two and a half years, we've been you know, talking about the alignment work. Um, and we started with, you know, uh, an external vendor who uh, helped us kind of do some of the foundation setting um, really related to goals that we hope to achieve as we come together uh, as a new single uh, department. Um, that, that consultant that we worked with assisted us and we had teams of staff that were involved kind of all along the way. Um, with really doing deep dives into various subject matters um, that you know, both legacy agencies uh, were working in. And uh, they also helped us with some stakeholder engagement processes, um, ho hosting some town halls, um, getting feedback from uh, external agencies, partners you know, throughout the state, um, both for legacy public health as well as for legacy health and human services. And so then in March of uh, 2022, that work kind of culminated in a final change package, which really articulated the goals of what the agencies hope to achieve through the realignment process. And those goals included development of an integrated organizational structure, uh, creating a shared direction among staff and partners and a shared connection with the big picture, uh, to create a welcoming and efficient front door for Iowans who seek the services and supports that Health and Human Services provide, um, to effectuate closed loops and warm handoffs when we do uh, encounter Iowans that are in need of services and supports, and improved use and integration of the data that's collected by both of the legacy agencies. Uh, so that really is the, you know, the goals that we are um, working to accomplish. That final change package was published in March of 2022. And uh, so that's really when we began um, the kind of effectuation of the merger. What initial challenges and successes have you witnessed during the realignment? I think some of the successes that we've experienced so far are uh, new relationships among um, people <laughs> that are within the system, both at the State uh, Department of Health and Human Services as well as with our partners. I think we have a renewed commitment um, to serving uh, the people that we serve at Iowa Health and Human Services. In addition to a renewed commitment, I think we also have renewed vigor uh, for that work, and we have a lot of forward momentum. We have, uh, we're fortunate to have Director Garcia as our um, director of our agency, and uh, she is um, a really energetic individual with a lot of big goals, and so that really sets st a strategic path for the rest of us to kind of get behind that and um, use that opportunity. In terms of some of the challenges we've experienced, as you can imagine, you know, combining uh, two departments into one, we all have uh, our independent processes and procedures, and sometimes those go down to the bureau level. And so um, keeping everybody informed about what's happening and moving as quickly as we can without breaking things have been uh, some of the challenges that we've had. Were there any other aspects of the process that you found helpful? One of the things that made me a little bit nervous at the time um, is that, um, you know, Director Garcia was very um, open about the analysis that she was doing of the work of the two departments and um, talking about the potential that these that the departments might come together. And at the time, you know, it was a little unsettling because we didn't really know exactly where it was headed. We weren't sure that the agencies were going to come together. 
Um, but in retrospect, as I think about that, um, you know, it was it, it was actually very uh, very smart on her part um, because she started socializing this concept of bringing the work of the agencies together um, and giving people a forum to talk about it, to express their concerns or the opportunities that they saw. Um, and so I think, you know, looking back, even though it was a little uncomfortable at times because it felt a little forward, um, it was really actually a very good move because um, when, when it was kind of announced that we are going to become one department, I would say that, there, you know, there wasn't shock and surprise. And, you know, she had those conversations um, openly with stakeholder groups. She had those with team members. She had those with legislators. Um, and so she was, she, was, she was very forward thinking in her communication strategy. Thank you, Sarah. Randy, what has this process been like within your HIV division specifically? Are there any successes you can share? You know, the biggest success so far has been what um, Sarah touched on in terms of data sharing. So we had been working for many years on um, attempting to share data with the Medicaid program. And we had a very limited data sharing agreement, but we had been unable to sign a more comprehensive data sharing agreement until the alignment started. And now we have completed that data sharing agreement. Historically, how has the Bureau of HIV, STI, and Hepatitis, and Medicaid collaborated in Iowa, and how do you see these collaborations changing going forward, specifically around cross-agency communication? So, Randy, I'll jump in here and then feel free to add, but uh, Rachel, the answer to that is yes. And so sitting on a ca in a cabinet structure with our Medicaid director, right, it, you know, there's something about there about creating relationships, um, seeing people uh, in, the, in the same room, um, having an opportunity to talk about collective uh, goals and um, strategy. And so uh, we have just recently kind of gotten into a new cadence related to leadership meeting structures. So we have an opportunity to meet with the director as an executive leadership team um, twice a month. And then we also get together on more operational issues as a cabinet also twice a month. So we're going to have you know weekly opportunities to sit in the same room and um, talk about you know common goals, um, strategic initiatives um, as we move forward here in this new department structure. At the level of the HIV program, um, I will say that we had our first um, data sharing agreement was put in place in 2013. Um, and it was fairly limited. Um, so it allowed us to access the Medicaid registration system to make sure that um, people in Ryan White um, who might be in Medicaid that we could um, uh, um, um, understand that and, and uh, validate that they were enrolled in Medicaid. Um, so we could confirm receipt of specific services. We could um, ensure payer of last resort. But we had to do that client by client. Um, so we could we had access to a claims database and the enrollment system, but only on a client by client basis. Um, and that's evolved now that we have this new data sharing agreement to allow us to do wholesale data matching, um, which we have just started. Um, and we tried to do that as part of the uh, 2016 HIV affinity group that was um, sponsored by CMS and HRSA. Um, and really, we're just unable to reach an agreement with Medicaid um, for a number of reasons. So now that we have signed that, we've just done our first data match, and so we've been able to look at the data. Um, and we also have um, a process to meet monthly with Medicaid staff on those data and what, what we plan to do with them and how we can now use them to improve services. So we have people who know who we are, we know who they are, and we are you know building a rapport between the two programs. We're going to move on into data sharing. Congratulations, you've just passed your new data sharing agreement between Medicaid and the Division of Public Health. You've touched a little bit on some of the roadblocks that states face with regards to data sharing, but can you share a little bit more about how you've overcome those challenges? Are there any lessons learned that other states could use? We have a great assistant attorney general who has been um, um, here with me. I've been in the department 22 years. And I've been working with her that whole time. 
Um, so we understand our programs together very well. Um, this is our fourth Medicaid director, I think, that we had asked uh, to share data with. And, you know, I think the alignment and coming together as HHS just completely changed the nature of the conversation. Um, so it really was, um, it, it really changed to what's in the best interest of the client and how do we go about doing that in the best way? And that was never the conversation before. Um, some of the roadblocks really were around um, federal provisions that they believed uh, precluded uh, data sharing. Um, and then the difference between a HIPAA-covered entity and, and one that was not um, covered by HIPAA. And um, believing, I think, also that the risk the risks to the agency outweighed any benefit that could potentially been for the client. So I, you know, I think that those are the things that really changed. I guess I would just respond to to um, Sarah's comments that you know persistence. I've learned that persistence is probably the best thing um, that you can do, and that you just come back. Opinions change, interpretations change, people change. Um, and, you know, I think as long as you keep coming back um, in a positive way, asking for uh, a reinterpretation or a reassessment of whether all the conditions are still in place um, that precluded um, data sharing in the past and see whether there isn't an opportunity to change that. In addition to being able to calculate your viral suppression numbers, what else does this new data sharing agreement allow you to do that you could not do before? Um, we wanted to ensure that it that it specifically said um, client level follow up um, because that also seemed to be a sticking point um, in in our interpretation between HIPAA covered and non HIPAA covered entities. So we we it allows for linkage and reengagement services to be pro provided directly to Medicaid participants by people in the HIV program, um, and um, we do have a little bit of. Um, you know, we'd like to get the managed care organizations involved as well, and I think they are very interested in being involved. But at this point, we haven't worked through this, the re-release um, because the data sharing is, is really at the state level and, and doesn't uh, extend to the managed care organizations at this time. And so I think we're still kind of talking about how to involve managed care organizations. Um, it also ensures um, that we can provide coordination of safety net services for people who are at risk for those conditions who might be Medicaid participants as well as people living with HIV, STIs, or viral hepatitis. So it's pretty broad that way. Uh, we can evaluate and improve the completeness of our surveillance systems using their data, and we can use the data to compile aggregate statistics such as uh, chlamydia screening rates is one thing we particularly wanted to look at. Um, or viral suppression among P Medicaid participants. So we've tried to make it much broader, um, in including the other areas of the department. In terms of the data sharing process itself, the nuts and bolts, what are the roles of each division and what process do you use for matching the data? Who is sending the data where? And what are you trying to calculate or discover with this data? We are sending it through a secure FTP mechanism right now to exchange the data. We send them um, an initial file of uh, people with HIV in the surveillance system. They do the matching at the Medicaid side. So they match to everybody um, who has, um, that matches to our database. Um, and then they add to that or append to it anybody that has an HIV-related claim that maybe didn't match so that we get information on um, who they may um, um, have as being diagnosed with HIV that perhaps is not in our surveillance system. They send that back to us with, with those names attached, and we investigate some of that and then try to determine um, who is living with HIV and is uh, um, a true case, um, and we use the surveillance system as sort of the the truth. Um, although we try to do some other investigation to see, you know, where some of these other claims may be coming from. They may be related to prep. They may be related to post exposure pro prophylaxis. Um, you know, any number of things. So we've we've been doing some of that investigation. 
Um, and then we um, calculate the, the viral suppression um, and um, send that back over to uh, the Medicaid people at that point so that they have it um, by um, each of the managed care organizations and then for the fee-for-service population. Has the new super agency structure resulted in any changes to how people enroll in each of their respective programs? Or has that process remained the same? Not for the HIV program. So we certainly have not changed that enrollment procedure at all. Um, we have field benefit specialists across the state and our clients enroll that way. Um, and they, you know, they ensure, they, they find the, the benefit home for every client. So if that's Medicaid, they then help them enroll in Medicaid. So there is that connection, but we haven't changed anything specifically because of our alignment at this point. But I will say, Rachel, that one that one of the goals, um, one of our new divisions is called community access. And so all of the entitlement program eligibility work is intended to be consolidated in our community access uh, division. But that's that's where we're headed in terms of our goal. In 2020, IDPH reported that there was a three year sustained reduction in the transmission of HIV in the state. And we're wondering what your thoughts are on what made this successful. And also, what are you looking for in the future with these numbers? You know, I really point to um, consistent leadership in, in our uh, bureau and, and programs. Um, I think we really have that as a strength. But um, in, in 2016, we were given an opportunity um, to uh, um, apply for supplemental funding through the Ryan White program. So they had funding available from some states that were um, struggling to spend down 340B generated funds and they made funds available to states. Um, we have gone after those funds um, as strongly as we possibly could. And um, prior to 2016, we averaged about seven to eight million dollars for our bureau for all of our programs. Um, and since um, since that time, we've exceeded uh, $25 million per year. So it's been quite an increase. And over that length of time, we've brought in an extra $90 million into the state. And we really invested that into our Ryan White system. Um, one other thing that we have that, that doesn't sound like um, it would be um, um, something that we would call an asset, but we don't really have an epicenter of HIV in Iowa. So there is... Um, no place um, where we have a concentration of people living with HIV. Uh, Polk County, um, Des Moines is our largest metro area, and um, less than 40% of people with HIV live in that area. So what it's done is caused us to um, create a statewide network of providers. So we have really five Part C clinics that are spread across the state. Our case management agencies are spread across the state. Our prevention agencies are spread across the state. And we have invested heavily in those um, prevention and care services. But we've added case managers, we've added DIS, we've added testing. Um, and so I think it's all of those things coming together finally um, in the state. We've always had very good viral suppression rates, and right now we have uh, actually the highest viral suppression rates in the nation. Um, and, you know, it, it, we kept predicting that that would eventually lead to a, to a decrease in transmission, but it just seemed like it had never happened until we were able to uh, increase this investment. So that's, those are the factors that I point to. Randy and Sarah, thank you again for sharing your experiences in Iowa around how Medicaid and Ryan White HIV AIDS programs are working together to improve care for low-income people living with HIV in the state. To learn more about state and territorial health agency, Medicaid, and public health partnerships, I encourage you to visit ashdo.org. That's A-S-T-H-O dot O-R-G. Thank you.